hello everyone. Thanks for coming to this uh, this talk, Comics Pushing the Boundaries. Uh, my name is Bob Sikoriak, and um, I'm joined here today by Daryl Ayo, Jennifer Camper, um, Heather Benjamin, and Kate LaCour. Um, Annie Mock, unfortunately, uh, is sick and it wasn't able to make it. So you'll see some of her slides later, but she won't be here in person to talk about them. So um, the reason uh, the reason we decided to do this talk was because of the Zap show that's up right now. I suggested to Anel that we do a discussion about comics, um, inviting other people in to the to the galleries basically as an excuse to sort of um, bring people in to see the Zap show. I wasn't necessarily thinking we'd talk about Zap, and we're not necessarily going to talk about Zap, but I'm sure we're going to talk about some of the issues around Zap. But uh, I, was, I was more interested in just um, exposing more people to this history and, um, and I think ultimately responding to it. I, I, I hesitated in terms of even talking about Zap at all, <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think we're here, and I think it's sort of the jumping off point for this. The sh the uh, the uh, idea for the panel kind of evolved into being sort of about controversy, into about uh, provocation in comics, um, about combativeness that 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 uh, cartoonists sometimes express in their work, um, and we've chosen a panel here that deals with these issues. Uh, in very different ways. Um, so in any case, I thought I would start with a few pages of Zap, partially because I think there's general issues around um, what the Zap cartoonists were doing that I think apply to all kinds of comics now. And and I wanted to sort of bring up a few things that I thought were potentially related to uh, what we're talking about here, specifically. So... Um, I, I was trying to find a picture of. I was trying to find images that would be uh, <laughs> that would be suitable for all ages, which is difficult with that. Um, but I like this piece from Crumb. Uh, thinking of provocation, it's actually it's against the white man, um, <laughs> and not usually the the um, the images we expect from him. Uh, so this is a Crumb page from one of the earliest issues, and this is an S. Clay Wilson page, and I think. Uh, his stuff is very dense and much better uh, viewed uh, in person in the in the in the images on the wall. But I think S. Clay Wilson kind of encouraged Crumb to sort of push his his um, subject matter uh, to the extreme. Although I don't know if anyone ever got quite as extreme as S. Clay Wilson. Um, but it everything in in uh, Zap isn't about um, controversy or, or or provocation. Uh, there's a lot of self-expression in it as well, which is something I think we take for granted in comics today. Um, that was definitely a shift. So uh, here we've got a page from Spain, and uh, this is his his superhero uh, uh, left-wing freedom fighter, Trash Man. So we have this aspect of of Zap as well as um, the work of Riff, Rick Griffin, who said that one of the reasons he kept wanting to be in Zap was to spread the word of his uh, Christianity. So these things somehow coexisted in Zap, and there's something about the multiplicity of viewpoints, even in a even in a um, comic that seems very um, very um, iconic or very focused. There's only seven artists in Zap, uh, pretty much, except for a few latecomers to the game. But even so, there's a pretty broad range of material. Um, there was a lot of experimentation in pages like this from Victor Moscoso and uh, Robert Williams. Obviously, a lot of these artists fall into more than one category. Um, just in terms of, of um, general concepts I wanted to bring up, um, a lot of the artists we're talking to today really play with um, sort of experimenting with the form of comics. So I thought it was valuable to bring this up. And then the last, the last real um, theme of, of Zap in a lot of ways was entertainment. Um, Gilbert Shelton's work uh, really sort of came from the tradition of Mad Magazine and earlier comic strips where um, it's going for laughs. And even though the subject matter is is very much of its time, it still really follows a tradition of 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 comics that uh, that um, that really 
emphasize the entertainment value of them. In this category, I've also put Paul Mavrides, who came in very late to Zap, uh, kind of as a, a pinch hitter after Crumb was losing interest and uh, Rick Griffin had died. Um, and I feel like Paul Mavrides also kind of responds to the tradition of Zap, um, where he's, I almost feel like he's riffing off of the ideas that Zap had already uh, played with over the last, oh, I would say 25 or 30 years before he came in. Um, the one other thing I wanted to say about sort of Zap as a group, sorry these slides are a little, little washed out, but uh, is there's also the sense of community that's involved. And, and obviously all cartoonists sort of have to find their, find their flock. Um, I think that um, the, the, um, the grouping of these seven artists uh, is really important and they would often do jam strips together. So this is all the artists working on one strip together. Um, but one thing that's kind of interesting was Crumb was rather frustrated with the other people in the group because they didn't want to bring in more artists and Crumb was kind of interested in expanding what Zap was, and 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 some of the other artists were more protective of of keep, keeping it in the click, um, and again, you know, our response to Crumb <laughs> can be pretty uh, 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 complicated, and I think something that's important to note is that he actually brought in the first woman cartoonist into Zap, which is Eline Crumb, I mean Eline Kaminsky Crumb, who collaborated with him in strips in the last issue. So uh, finally, finally a woman gets into Zap <laughs> in 2016. Um, and th one thing sort of generally about Zap that I think relates to what we're gonna talk about today is means of distribution. Um, the first issue of Zap was famously uh, distributed in San Francisco out of a baby carriage. This is a, a drawing that Crumb did of him and his wife Dana at the time uh, selling selling copies of the first issue. Um, so this is where it began. And then last month, I bought the latest copy of Zap on Comixology, a Amazon company, as it tells us in the upper left-hand corner. So the means of distribution of comics has changed, and that has, I think, really affected the possibilities of, of what comics could be as well. So um, I can't remember all of the all of the uh, categories I just mentioned, <laughs> but essentially experimentation, provocation, uh, uh, community, entertainment, distribution—all these things affect the kind of comics that get out, and also maybe what audiences we're reaching with our comics. So what I'd like to do now is I'm going to introduce each of the artists individually. We'll look at some of their work, and we'll open up the conversation more to um, uh, the way each of these artists and maybe the way comics in general have kind of pushed the boundaries of, of, um, of either uh, form or content. So first of all, we have Daryl Ayo, and let me read his bio for you. Uh, Daryl is right here, and he, uh, he, he, his bio reads, armed with the internet in his pocket and a firestorm in his head, Daryl Ayo has carved a niche within comics culture as both a forward-thinking cartoonist and a strong critical voice. The centerpiece of his illustration career is the cartooning project Little Garden, which he has produced for over 10 years in various formats. And you can read his critical writing on his website, comicscube.com. Uh, so here's Daryl, uh, and let's uh, give him a hand up. <laughs> So you've sent me a bunch of your comics and, and images. I'm going to sort of scroll through them. If you have anything you want to jump in to talk about, uh, feel free. Um, I was fascinated by one thing that you brought up. And I don't know if these are all – are these all from Little Garden, uh, all the images you sent me? I can't remember, but probably okay. most of them. You might want to pick up the mic. Can you <laughs> most of them, definitely. Uh, I'm not sure if all of them are. Um, I, I was really I was really interested in what you were saying about how – um, the, this comic has an extreme take on friendship and community. And I was wondering if you could elaborate on that a little bit. I thought that was a, a, a provocative statement. <laughs> well, uh, I went to college. I saw the movie Crumb. And, and uh, you know, I tried to you know, do all the, like, well, not really so much the subject matter type of stuff, but just, like, the manic drawing and everything. And um, I, I guess... 
really not feeling like I was like quite making things work in comics. And um, one day I said to myself, um, tomorrow, because you know you always make your resolutions for the next day. Tomorrow I'm going to um, I'm going to draw this one thing. It's going to be exactly what I want to draw, and it's going to be nothing more than I want to draw, nothing less than I want to draw. And so I ended up drawing this. And um, then I said, that was okay. That worked out. All right. Uh, I'm going to do it again tomorrow from that day. And then after that, it was the first test. It was like, okay, now it's a holiday. Will I be able to do it? Boom, did it. And I was like, all right, great. And then I said, okay, I'm just going to do this every day. And I, you know, like before I was trying to make comics, comics like you'd see either in the comic shop or on the internet. But instead of that, I ended up doing like just only drawing this exact type of thing um, as it came to me. Like I said, like nothing, no, no, nothing extra, nothing, um, nothing that like one would say, oh, you have to do this to make a comic. And um, as it turns out, it turns out that the theme that was uh, coming forward from looking at my own stuff was uh, friendship, community. I was like, oh, okay, that's pretty sweet. That's a nice thing that I did a comic cartoon about. <laughs> so are these are these portraits of um, are these related to the strip or are these new? No. These uh, this is uh, this is an experiment of mine that uh, well, as you can, it's dated, so there's that, but. Mm -hmm. um, I you know I've been really fascinated um, with uh, just sort of how to draw black people within the form of comics, especially black and white comics, and looking at uh, old comics and um, old illustrations and advertisements. Uh, there's a place it's not relevant; it's out of business, but it was in White Plains, and my mother used to take me there. That old Black Magic, and in in the middle of selling like black art, they'd also have like on the walls these old advertisements with like all these racist caricatures. It was a very interesting juxtaposition, and so I've had it in my head a long time ago to kind of absorb that stuff from from like the old media and form it into something useful to me. Uh, because I feel as though I can take whatever I want from whoever I want for whatever reasons I feel are necessary. I guess this is more little garden here. Yes. Now you said you said something that I thought was really interesting about um, um, there's a there's like um, the the small community internal dynamics of of, of cartooning leading to um, like a reflexive tendency toward conformity, um, which is kind of a big idea. I'm wondering, the way you distribute your comics, uh, they're often online. So do you feel like that you have a, an online community? Do you feel like you're, um, do you feel like you're trying to sort of push them in, in new directions? Or, or is that even an issue or of interest to you? I'm curious how you... Um, do you mean just for the distribution of comics, or do you mean like it's something in another in other way? Um, oh, you can uh, any way you want to respond to that. <laughs> I think that half formed question would could. Uh... <laughs> I I don't know. Um, most of my activity on the internet is um, act is just me like working through anxiety, so it's um, not really intended to do anything for anyone. But people seem to like it, and um, so then. Um, but as for comics, uh, I, I've never, like, gone, like, I go to comic shows, and I've never gone to a comic show and, like, sold a comic, like, in a sales pitch sort of way. I just sort of show up and put my placard out and assume that, like, my name will bring people who are interested over. And if they're not interested, I'm not going to try to twist anyone's arm. So it's that. I mean, I do things every day on the Internet, and then... When people get the opportunity to see me, they have already built that relationship with me. I don't like market or anything, so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to show a few more here. If you have any other comments about the strip or anything else. Oh yeah. Um, earlier before this, we were talking about um, about uh, getting your um, about sort of like staying interested in in stuff and like not really being um, what's the word I'm looking for. Not being 
not not being sort of uh, held back by um, who were we talking about? We were talking about sort of like um, like being interested in the work and everything. And I just found that um, like le- stop. I stopped wanting to finish comics and started just enjoying what I was drawing. And I started getting into a mode of just just focusing really more intensely on one panel at a time and being fine with it being incomplete for the moment. And those ones always come out way better because I'm just, uh, I'm enjoying the process instead of just rushing to be finished. Do you think, does that affect how you, um, how, how you even distribute your work online? Do you think that that is, um, is that a conscious thing now? Do you, I, I'm assuming you don't have like regular updates of your work. You put it out when you're when you feel it's um, um, when you feel it's ready. I used to have regular updates of my work, um, and it's fairly easy for me to have regular updates actually, just because um, the more just getting into enjoying the process of doing stuff makes it work a lot faster than uh, being consumed with. Uh, uh, anxiety about um, getting things done or like deadlines or like, oh, I got to get this by this. Instead, just sort of like enjoying what I'm doing one day at a time gets things done way faster than uh, any other method that I've encountered. Cool. <laughs> I like that panel. So we'll come back to everyone after we sort of introduce everyone. So um, I want to move on to Heather. Heather Benjamin has been self-publishing zines of her drawings since 2008. Her projects include the series Sad Sex, um, the book The Exercise, Exorcise book, uh, and the self-published romantic story, which is a collection inspired by classic romance comics. She uh, produces uh, zines and also uh, works on larger paintings. And her next book project will be a collection of her drawing and painting work to be published by Sacred Bones in September. Please welcome Heather. So you sent me a lot of imagery, and I'm not sure where a lot of this comes from. Um, I mean, some of it is some of it is is marked, but some of it I don't know if it, if it exists uh, as part of kind of a abstract narrative or if it if they exist as individual images maybe you can talk to us a little bit about this uh, work yeah um i guess well i tried to send you kind of like a i tried to send like a variety of things um so some of some of what i sent some of i some of what will be up here is um from zines i've put out and other things are just standalone drawings i've made this is an older drawing it's from 2011 and it was in a in a little drawing zine that I self-published um, called Hate Breed. Um, and yeah, I've always kind of liked this drawing, even though it's older and not totally similar to what I make now. Mm-hmm. Um, this is a more recent drawing. It's not from Romantic Story, but it's from, uh, which is my most recent book, but it's from a zine that I made while I was making Romantic Story, like kind of while I was working on the book, which took me about a year. Um, I took a break from it to make some drawings that weren't going into the book because as I'm sure anyone who works on deadlines knows, sometimes you just have to take a break from the deadline work and just make other work instead. So that's what I was going for here. And it it looks like what's in the book, but it felt better to make it because it wasn't going in the book. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, And the name of the zine that it's from is called Demons Are Forever. That's the cover of Romantic Story, which is the book I was just talking about. Um, I self-published it uh, last last fall. I was just getting really into um, like classic romance comics and like very very like sincerely into them, and then also really grossed out by them. Like I I feel like very conflicted about them because I like of course I absolutely like love the aesthetic and. Um, I'm really drawn to, I'm drawn to the classic, like dynamic, like classic um, romance, like relationship, I guess, that's depicted literally the same in all of the comics, which is like the sad crying woman and the stoic 
burly man. And then she finally, you know, she has to throw herself on the bed and cry. And then he'll finally come home and like give her what she wants. So that's like that formula never gets old to me. But then it also simultaneously like has always been old to me. <laughs> so I just like got totally obsessed with um those comics and just found myself, especially um, there's like this formula that that I kind of was working with um, on this cover. I kind of worked with like throughout the book, uh, which is the this sort of like visual formula that exists in all the romance comics. That's this couple embracing in the background and then a really upset, like lonely woman in the foreground um, lamenting the fact that she's like not getting any. And um, <laughs> it's hilarious to like look at all of these, all the covers of these of these old comics and they all literally have that exact same, um, formula. So I just got really obsessed with that and started redrawing it in my own way. So most of the drawings in the book, um, are sort of like working off of that formula. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, this is like, this is unpublished, uh, just an ink drawing I made, uh, actually just a couple months ago. And this is kind of, this is kind of the direction I've been going in like after romantic story. I thought that I would work on that book and then be sort of tired of the like woman, the like lamenting woman staring at couples embracing theme, but I wasn't tired of it yet. So I, I just, it has kept coming out in my work, even though I've been sort of hashing it out for over a year now. Um, it's coming out in a different way, but it's sort of the same theme. Um, that's a page from Romantic Story, so you can kind of see what I'm talking about with that um, that that sort of like formulaic approach to making the drawings that I had um, with the couple. And I mean, I added sort of like my own my own like motifs that are sort of recurring throughout that book, like the idea of the window, which to me was kind of representing like nostalgia and memory, um, rather than being quite as like straightforward as uh, as the original like incarnations of those drawings where it would literally be like three figures in a park and like they're like they're kissing behind a tree and the woman's on a park bench or something like that it was a little more abstracted for me um and i've also been really interested in like the the symbolism of us of a lady sphinx um in a lot of different in a lot of different ways in my work for the last couple years so kind of combining my interest in like this sort of like strong regal animalistic sort of vulgar yet feminine um, half human, half animal figure, like reconciling that with the nostalgia and sort of sensitivity of the lamenting the couple and just a lot of ideas of like, I was thinking a lot about like the, the conventions of the sort of heterosexual relationships that are described in those comics and just the internal struggle um, that I go through anyway, personally as a woman of reconciling like really subscribing to and understanding and relating to those feelings and then also simultaneously being so like just rejecting them completely and being really upset by them. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that whole book is kind of just my, my like internal dialogue about that, I guess. <laughs> this might be a question for everyone, but it seems that a lot of comics end up being about other comics or about they're, they're, a lot of them are responses to what um, people have done before, and I, yeah. my work is r incredibly self-reflexive. I don't, but, but I'm sometimes surprised at how much everyone seems to sort of be in dialogue with the comics that have come before. Um, that's not really a question. That's just something <laughs> I'm thinking about, and maybe we can all sort of talk about that uh, after we go through the rest of the pictures. Um, I, I wasn't sure if I should include this or not because it's actually an editorial illustration that I made. Um, but when I was thinking about provocative drawings, I definitely thought about this one. Um, I think this is the first time I've really, or the first time in like f years that I drew uh, male genitalia. I just like sort of really shy away from that. But um, <laughs> so that to me, that really felt provocative, I guess. Um, it was for a work of short fiction. Um, I'm going to totally butcher her name because I don't know how to, I don't know how to pronounce her last name, but Heidi Jul Julevitz, um, I think is how you say it, but she's an incredible uh, writer and she published a piece in Vice last year and I did this, illust I made this illustration for it and the piece was, um, just so you can sort of understand a little more contextually, I believe it was that uh, she 
her it was either her aunt or her grandmother had had this stash of old uh, pulpy romance novels f- that she had grown up reading, and uh, the author had gone through all of them and sort of taken out sentences she liked and collaged them all into a longer piece. So it was this really uh, interesting sort of like cut up, reminiscent of like cut ups, um, surrealist way of coming up with a story, and it was like a super pornographic and um, surrealist short story that I was really interested in. And uh, yeah, this was just the illustration I made for it. So this is the last page of romantic story or the second to last page of romantic story um, where, I mean, the book isn't, the book doesn't have a really concrete narrative, but uh, I think I was talking about this earlier. I, I did sort of organize the drawings in it with a lot of like sequential intention. Um, So there's like a lot of, I don't know. There was a lot of like thought for me about why this would be one of the last, last images. Uh, <laughs> this is an album cover I I drew for a friend's band. Um, I yeah. I guess I just included it just thinking about provocative. Well, I guess provocative to me is just me drawing penises. Actually, now that I'm thinking about it, I was like, this is provocative. <laughs> I guess I just don't do that very often, and it kind of kind of weirds me out when I do it. I don't know. Just, I'm always surprised at myself afterwards, I think. <laughs> uh, oh, that one's pretty washed out, but that's another romantic story, uh, romantic story page. Wow, I did send you a lot of images. <laughs> we're getting through them. It's fine. <laughs> um, yeah, this is a, a painting I made uh, several years ago. Um, wasn't published as part of anything. That's from the, this is from the back of the zine hate breed that I, um, that the first illustration was from. So it's from, it's older. It's from 2011. So the zines are, are collections of illustrations or do they also have some sort of, uh, the, the zines always area? usually, I mean, I don't really think about them too. Well, I don't want to say I don't think about them too much. I don't, I don't think about them too much as, as far as like, what story is this going to tell? Because my, my work isn't like very explicitly narrative, I or I suppose, or it's it's definitely not traditional comics. Mm-hmm. So, um, but I but that said, I do always have sort of like an idea that I'm trying to express and a beginning and an end that I am thinking about. So this is this was an end, um, but yeah, they are generally just little fold out, little photocopied fold out zines of drawings. Mm-hmm. It's another romantic story. Yeah, sorry about the lighting. That's it's, okay. it's a little washed out. <laughs> well, great. Thanks. Yeah. You can applaud. Here's Jennifer Camper. You can applaud Jennifer Camper. <laughs> <laughs> so Jennifer is a cartoonist and graphic artist. Her books include Rude Girls and Dangerous Women and Subgirls with a U and a Z. And she edited two Juicy Mother comics anthologies. Her work appears in numerous publications, comic books, and anthologies, and has been exhibited internationally. She's also edited the Queer Pinups Playing Cards um, and is the founding director of the Queers Comics Conference. So, um, again, you've sent me a bunch of comics. Yeah, we don't have to. We, well, we'll, we'll go through them. We don't need to um, – you don't need to read them or you don't have to describe all of them if you want. But um, you, your work um, – uh, deals with a lot of um, a lot of um, themes around communities, um, and um, you had this great um, quote here that you mentioned to me. Uh, you were said you were interested in how um, comics have been used by outsider communities uh, as a form of expression and advocacy, and that seemed like really yeah, pertinent. I think- yeah, comics are so cheap and easy that um, it's, a, it's a, an easy way to get an idea across. So for a lot of people who didn't have access to maybe galleries or publishers or whatever, you know, comics are a way that you can jump in and make it yourself. Um, this comic was printed on a postcard and banned by the U.S. Post Office, so I was really proud. <laughs> it turns out you cannot write a dirty word on a postcard. And and so t- technically, I guess you can't write fuck on the back of the postcard and mail it. But anyway, lots of people have mailed this postcard and it went through, but one did get seized in Texas, and it was deemed lewd and lascivious and obscene. So is it only illegal in Texas? No, you can't. 
I, my understanding is you can't write a dirty word on any postcard in the mail, so on the outside. It, yeah. it would have to be wrapped. But yeah. obviously, <laughs> if you write something dirty in the content of the postcard, I think it would be a really interesting case because I, then they're reading your message. Yeah. But if you just write "fuck" on a postcard <laughs> and mail it, I don't know. So yeah. <laughs> But this was um, this was conceived as a postcard. And no, then you well, this was a or, comic, okay. and then I made a bunch of my comics into postcards. Yeah. And I did this because all these women I know would get upset when men harass them on the street, and I always have an answer. So I'm like, so what if they say something? Just say something worse back. Yeah. So that's why I did this. Cause like, this is how I respond to this. Yeah. Well, it reminds me of Al Jaffe's. Uh, yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> snappy answers snappy to answers, stupid, stupid uh, comebacks. Yeah, when dykes enter beauty contests. <laughs> and again, you were talking about how we react to comics, and I think we're reacting not only to other comics, but to just all the arts and media. And for me, I'm, I'm mixed Arab American, I'm female, I'm queer. I wasn't seeing any stories in the arts and media that reflected my opinions or my experience. And even within the gay community, my experience wasn't really there that much. So I did it myself. And I think that's a lot of what we're doing at outsiders in mm -hmm. comics. It's like, well, we're not seeing our ideas and our experiences represented, so we create it for ourselves. Right, right. Caucasian translation. You know, and again, it, all, so many of us live in many communities. So, you know, in the gay community, there's racism. In the women's communities, there's, you know, um, homophobia. There, you know, so you kind of bounce. Those of us who bounce between communities are always finding ourselves an outsider on many levels. Mm -hmm. So that's what I write about. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this was um, in the queer pinups card deck. So that was something you you edited that? Was that I conceived of the idea. This was the, we did the Queers and Comics conference two years ago or a year ago, um, the first one, and we wanted to have a product that we would sell as a fundraiser. So I got fifty four queer cartoonists to donate art and we printed this limited edition card deck. Fifty four because we had two jokers. Um and it was wonderful, and it was really a wonderful thing. And we're going to have another Queers and Comics conference in 2017 in San Francisco, and I think we'll do another kind of artifact just for that. Um, and, and I love getting a group of cartoonists together and making some special little thing for some, and you know, that would normally never exist. Mm -hmm. That's great. I broke this one in half just so it might be a little easier to read, but it's probably still too small. But... Um, Maybe you want to tell us, maybe you can give us the, the gist. Yeah, it's a letter to heterosexuals. Homosexuals are, are just like normal people, really, and they have jobs and spend lots of money from their double-income households, and they want to join the military and defend their country. To the next page. And, yeah, so, so the narrator is saying how queers are just so wonderful and normal and mainstream, and then these two dykes are anything but... And, and just playing against, you know, wanting a seat at the table versus wanting to kick the table over. <laughs> this is an excerpt from a longer piece called Ramadan, which um, I did. I'm, I'm not Muslim, but a lot of my friends are, and I was fascinated by the, you know, the queer Arab wrestling with her, her spirituality and the dilemma that they're going through. So I interviewed a bunch of friends of mine who are queer, um, Arab, and Muslim, and I wrote this story. And I did it in the second person because it was telling their story, not mine. And so this is just an excerpt from that. Um... Yeah. <laughs> and my early stuff was all printed in, in like newspapers, gay newspapers and comic books, and they have really cheap um, newsprint. So I developed this real high contrast black and white style so it would reproduce really well, even with bad printing and bad paper. So what, what, 
what era was that? Can you talk about that just this, in terms so, of... The- yeah, so it was, I mean, I guess a lot of it was in the 90s, but I was doing a bi-weekly comic that ran syndicated in every major city had a gay or feminist or queer publication. And so there was a bunch of us who did that. Um, and, you know, we made not much money, but it was a way to do a comic every two weeks and get it out there from 10 to 25 different publications. And then at the end of a few years, you had a book. Um, and that all fell apart with the internet. <laughs> <laughs> it's fun while it lasts. But it was nice, and it was a way to comment on sort of um, doing political commentary on what was going on in the world and doing something and getting it out there really, you know, these were all single page comics. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And more from that era, yeah, I take it. Yeah. Just from the format. Right. Yeah. Now I'm doing much longer stories, which don't lend themselves so well to slides. Um, and so I, I go back and forth. I like doing these sort of one pa- you know, one page stories but I also have been doing more and more longer narratives. It's all fiction. Um, and, you know, you get to have characters and plots and <laughs> all that kind of stuff. So, Do you, do you feel like that was um, a progression of what you were interested in? Or is it, is it kind of a response to the market and, and what people are looking for in comics now? Do you... I think it was what I wanted to do. Because after these, I did Subgirls, which was like, a, I call it a graphic novella. But it is a long-term, st- long story. I think it's just that, yeah, it was more what I wanted to do. Um, but, yeah, it is also part of where the industry is going. But I don't, I don't think that was an influence so much. It's mm-hmm. just mm-hmm. it's more interesting right now for me to do these longer stories. Right. And, again, I was reacting, you know, so much of what – the, you know, in the 90s, the 80s, 90s, and even the early zeros, gay content was often about, the, you know, being a victim and being struggling. And I wanted, you know, to show the sort of glory in it. Mm-hmm. And I do a lot of comics about non living things <laughs> they don't really have a voice in our culture you know it turned out that i you realize as a cartoonist you're always drawing hands and faces and hands and faces and hands and faces and i thought well let me get away from that for a while so i have a bunch of a few of those <laughs> it's good again again the the less we don't hear from them as much so that's great <laughs> thanks so um I haven't figured out where to put in the clapping. Um, our last our last guest is Kate LaCour, and she was born in New York and lives in New Orleans. She's the creator of Milk Teeth, I Sees I, and Zero Is. Her weekly web comics, Vivisectionary and The Disciple, can be seen at Steady Group Comics, and her print and illustration uh, can be found at her website, Chart Brains. So, um, so thanks, Kate. Um, now, you also sent me a whole bunch of stuff, very disparate things. Um, I felt like you, um, uh, again, belonged in this group because, uh, you know, it's a whole other, it's a whole other kind of um, maybe shock to, to what you do for some people. Uh, you described on your website, you mentioned something about um, body horror beauty, which I thought was like a nice summation of, of what you do. Yeah, um, so uh, I'm really interested in in bodies and uh, um, horror. I try to draw stuff that um, scares me. I'm scared uh, easily, and I try to draw stuff that I'm interested in, um, but also stuff that makes me kind of uncomfortable just because I think some of the imagery that has the biggest charge at least for me, is things where I feel um, like drawn to it, but also kind of like repelled by it. Um, so I draw stuff that I think is, you know, um, I'm drawn from images that I think are really attractive and very like beautiful, and then also things that are kind of um, icky. Mm-hmm. <laughs> 
Yeah, so um, like anatomy is a big interest for me. Um, I'm really interested in science, um, and I'm really interested in um, religion. I'm really interested in uh, things that seem like mysterious or uh, maybe a little scary. So my work's something I really just kind of make for myself um, and is just kind of an exploration of those areas. So... I just kind of see where it goes. And these single images aren't really for anything. They're not in any books or anything like that. They're just something where it kind of came to me and I thought I'd paint it and see what was up with that. Mm -hmm. um, this is from Vivisectionary, um, which I put out once a month. So I had a lot of science books growing up. Uh, I was really interested in animals, really interested in nature um, and really interested in and actually scared by uh, anatomy books. I had um, one in particular that had uh, what the human body looked like without skin where you could see all the muscles and the veins and it really freaked me out um, and I would go and like kind of make myself look at it um, and so when I went to draw comics about like how things work um, that's something I went back to is those cool old science um, illustrations. And I try to add a little language to it, but not in English, so that uh, it reproduces that effect where you're not totally sure what's going on. There's some information there, but you can't quite get it. Uh, and this one is actually inspired by a uh, science video I saw when I was young that I liked about uh, this toad or frog that um, uh, fertilizes its gunk and then smears it on its own back and the skin grows over it. And then um, the, when the babies are ready, they kind of burst almost like a zit off of the, uh, the frog's back. So I was, uh, had that uh, real biology fact in mind when I painted this one. This is more the stuff I'm doing uh, lately. It's, um, this is from a book called Incision, and it's all uh, about a fusion of genders and um, like surgeries performed on the chakra system. There's a, this kind of Eastern thought that uh, the spirit and the body are related, which isn't something that was at all part of like the Western science discipline that I studied a little bit in high school and college. So it was interesting to fantasize about manipulating that system, that uh, like energetic system through uh, science and through like physical changes. So these aren't really in order, but that's from there. Um, I guess something I've been drawn to a bunch is this like, fear of deformation um, and also this feeling of transformation. There's a real like attraction and like fear and revulsion there too. So the idea of your body changing, um, making those things happen and then having those done to you is just something I'm really interested in. Oops, there we go. Yeah. Okay, this one's from my weekly webcomic called The Disciple. So this is the stuff, kind of stuff I've been doing more lately. And it's about um, this uh, process of going through all these like degradations and sufferings and stuff like that on this um, in service of a spiritual commitment to this like unseen force. So there's this... Uh, character here um, and he's having to skin himself alive uh, in this sequence uh, and then yeah in this one he's uh, having to castrate himself um, and he's like in pursuit of this you know touching the divine and is being called upon to do all this uh, um, really extreme stuff um, something I find in my work is I don't think it's really like, it's not 
political or like aggressive or confrontational, I don't think, um, in the same way that some of this, um, some comics seem like really powerful and empowered and like have this um, sort of ownership of it, like in your faceness. I think, I mean, I'm not very objective about it since they're my comics and I'm just kind of exploring my little like private obsessions, but I think they probably come off with a vibe that's a little more like creepy and pervy and introverted because of that, that um, I'm not thinking probably like the zap people were that there's something out there that I want to stand in opposition to and I want to communicate something about it like by subverting it or riffing on it or um, you know, uh, laughing about it or gathering a community against it. Uh, th the attitude I think that's in my work is uh, I want to go close the door and do my own weird little thing in here and then I kind of want to show you and see how you react to it. Uh, so it's a very, I don't know, uh, private and uh, idiosyncratic thing going on. Mm -hmm. This one's um, pretty old. It's like eight years old, 10 years old. But it was definitely the book that came to mind when uh, uh, I started thinking about like controversial and um, unconventional comics. So I actually set out with something in mind when I did it, which was um, let me think about what's the most or kind of uncomfortable uh, and raw uh, comic I could do that's outside of my boundaries, that's like too personal and uncomfortable because I'm really interested in reading autobio comics, you know, and, and people's personal stories. But a lot of times it feels like there's this um, layer of distance that's added in between, like if you do a memoir and um, you start wanting to kind of make it more relatable or more cute or more, um, um, not necessarily make yourself seem better, but uh, to understand it better. And I just wanted to do something that was very like not considered. So this one's all about like shame and childhood and um, not having really boundaries or awareness when you're little. So it's got a bunch of, it's got like popples in it. You saw there's some sexual fantasy stuff with Count Ducula and Barbies, <laughs> um, which is like humorous. But then there's also this stuff with like the fisting of her face and the, you know, scary, I mean, these aren't in order, but these um, kind of scary hallucinatory fantasies and autoerotic asphyxiation and stuff like that where it got like very serious and um, uh, kind of scary. Um, definitely not my best artwork or my best storytelling, but I think that was a time where I intentionally set out to um, make myself uncomfortable in comics, and it definitely accomplished that. Cool. Thanks. So I, I want to open this up uh, a little bit. I'm uh, not sure how we're doing for time, but... Um, Daryl, I feel like I went through your stuff so quickly. <laughs> you were first, and we were still getting the rhythm going. Was it, and you mentioned so many things that you um, that you were interested in discussing around these issues. And I was wondering if there was anything you wanted to jump in about again at this point, or am I putting you on the spot? <laughs> no, it's fine. Just uh, shoot. Well, no. Uh, okay. Uh, let's see. You had a whole bunch of things that. Uh, struck me as interesting. These slides are going too fast. I'll slow this down in a minute. Um, but, um, oh, I, th th this, and this kind of relates maybe to the way people um, uh, distribute their work. And um, we talked about that a little bit before the talk started. Um, and you had said that you feel like the counterculture of comics is not the counterculture of the of the world. And maybe we are sort of talking among ourselves a little bit versus maybe um, sort of thinking about like how our work um, uh, is um, 
is sort of seen by a broader public. Do you think about the distinctions in terms of um, in terms of audience or in terms of who's looking at your work and and how um, it's perceived? Yeah, but I, I think about that in so many different contexts. Uh, you can uh, choose one. Well, <laughs> well, for example. Um, uh, we a, a few of us have been talking about like the you talked and a few of you talked about uh, comics, uh, the comics here and the comics here being referential to other comics, and that's obviously whenever people have a common ground is also is always um, I mean you always find common ground somewhere and people always find something to relate to that, but it does become a little difficult to share that work with people outside of those parameters. And then um, I talk a, a bit with a few friends who find themselves kind of on the outs of comics and their stuff has a lot of um, interest for people who are not like comics folk, people who are not like big fans of comics or whatever, but the, those particular comics might be about, um, I don't know, some political thing or I guess uh, demographically focused or what have you. And I find that I find that that's uh, something that uh, doesn't really get taken into consideration a lot. But I don't know. Um, I don't know. That's like super broad. I have a lot of different ways of going on that one. <laughs> uh, uh, I don't know. <laughs> uh, like, is there anything about is there anything about the way that you make comics that these become issues for you? It seems like that the 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 work that you choose to put out is like has a almost a political viewpoint. I don't know if that's true or not, but do you feel like it is? Yes. But, um, it's, I feel like, uh, it's like the way uh, my political, politi my political that might be sort of, word. um, well, I mean, it, it works. I feel like everything is political on some level or another. Um, uh, but, uh, Oh yeah, this is a good one. That was like, go back to that one. sure. Um, I was doing these. I was doing these comics for a little bit that were mostly um, either a lot of them were just like me arguing with myself, and I just like split the points of view between two fictitious speakers. And um, I did a couple of them, not like a lot, just a few of them. But they were just like it was basically just me like dividing my opinions and uh, separating them into different personalities and like making them fight and. And so that's uh, and that's like found out. I mean, that felt like a very interesting way to um, to not really solve problems so much as talk about problems, present them, and present them as problems without actual um, resolutions. Just to let people know, this is something to think about, and something that you can think about, and something that you don't have to have an answer to. Um, and there's also, um, I, I I felt that. Uh, the single panel little garden illustrations were very um, like it. It was a really deep political act for me, just because of um, I was so enra enwrapped in uh, the comics orthodoxy of like uh, uh, sequential art panels and all that stuff, and and it's sort of like I I struck on this thing that didn't fit into that, and sort of coming to appreciate its value for what it was and just keep going regardless of what, what people would look at it and be like, this is okay, but this is like, you know, they have the look on their face like, this isn't really a comic though. I don't really know what to do with this. And like people would just say, like, I don't know what to do. And then it's fine. But then um, it's sort of a thing where you just sort of, you you have to make that choice of like, is it, does it, how much does it bother you that people don't know what to make of what you're making? And how much do you just want to say, oh, that's fine, and just push on because there's some kind of, uh, you can sense the intrinsic value of what you're doing. And um, when I would get away from that and try to like push myself towards doing what people expected and what people wanted, I found that it didn't work out as well. And so, you know, so through that and just, just through the reinforcement of like doing a better job of doing like weird stuff, that was kind of, I wouldn't say it's not definable, but it doesn't fit into the convenient boxes that exist in the world. Uh, I just sort of learned to just like, you know, make it. And if people don't get it, that's fine. And, and it will, 
eventually prove itself for you know it because even if nobody else gets it or nobody else does it if i do enough of it then it will exist on its own as its own category and it's fine and create a new thing that makes sense well along those lines i think um well you mentioned a lot of things <laughs> but something that sort of jumped out in listening to all, all of you speak um was um the idea of of um you know, working for, in your case, Jennifer, working for like a specific magazine or you doing uh, editorial illustration that, that let you finally draw male penises, <laughs> uh, male genitalia. <laughs> and then, and then uh, w with you, Kate, talking about um, this, the, the, the weekly strip that seems to be for... Um, kind of very personal and a lot of your work sort of is made just for you alone do you think it's it sounds like the responses you get from people may not be expected maybe in your case you're you're aiming toward uh getting a response and maybe in other cases uh it sort of shows up and then you have to sort of deal with it do you do you think about that all the time never in your work i i think that we at least for me i'm my first reader and it has to be something that I'm interested in seeing. It's like I'm creating this stuff for me because it's not out there. And then if anybody else likes it, that's fine. And I know some people won't like it. But I thought what's fascinating is that you are almost frightened by some of your work. And I wondered if you – I would love to hear more about that. Like it seems like – I mean, I don't know. I think we are our first readers. But then if you're also doing something that scares you, that's – I don't know. How does that work? Well, I don't know. Um, it's more interesting to me, I guess, if it's something where it feels like, um, hmm, I don't know why some things are scary and why they aren't. So I guess it's sort of um, a way to explore that is the more you draw it, the more you feel like you understand it, even though you don't at least I never have reached a point where um, I've gotten a more articulate like answer to it. After you've drawn something for a while, you feel like you um, have an intimacy with it. And so, so is, is the fear yeah. about creating it or is the scary part then being the reader who reads it? I think, um, gosh, someone was once asked... Um, Jenny Gonzalez Blitz was asked, like, why are you drawing the topics you draw? And she's like, well, I, the kind of comics I wanted to read didn't exist, so I drew them. And uh, for me, the sort of things that I like looking at are things where I feel like, ew, that's kind of creepy, but I want to keep looking at it. And so that's um, what I set out to do. Uh, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't, but it's always like an interesting thing to try to pursue because I never really am sure about why certain things are attractive and why certain things are um, kind of repulsive. Some things that should not be, um, that should be really scary are kind of boring to me and some things that, you know, shouldn't be very attractive or inexplicably kind of uh, interesting to stick around with. Yeah, I think there's fear as cartoonists. It's like we get really good at doing one certain thing, and then it's like, mm -hmm. okay, let me set the bar up a little higher. So then there's that, you know, can I do this really weird angle or this really difficult whatever? So I think we give that to ourselves. Well, something that relates back to um, what you were saying about uh, your audience and how you put it out is that uh, – with Tumblr and uh, platforms like that is you can put something out there really fast, which is nice if you're working on a long project and you don't mind letting little bits slip so that you can get that you know, little boost um, as you're going along and maybe some feedback. But um, it also uh, gives you a sense of what the audience likes, almost maybe too much so. Mm -hmm. Like some of the things that uh, I do that I think are less interesting or um, maybe more obvious or less, uh, some of those things are like, people like them a lot better than the things that I want to draw, um, which is fine. But then you're definitely tempted, or at least I am, to go do more of that, what's getting the, the positive response. Um, especially if, like I said, I do um, a weekly thing, it's for study groups. So I know that 
some amount of people are seeing it. So the desire to make it likable as opposed to serving the goal that it um, that I set out to have it do, it becomes pretty, um, it takes on a certain amount of like a, a, a momentum in that direction that I have to like steer it away from. I don't know, what, what's it like for you guys when you share your artwork as you go along? I actually kind of wish I did that less. Um, I find myself posting, like you said, like when you're working on a, a longer project, sometimes it could be nice to get that little boost of posting like a close-up of a page you're working on and then get some positive, hopefully positive feedback on it. But uh, recently I started kind of wishing that I didn't I didn't do that. I, I guess I'm not really sure why I wish I... Maybe I just want to make things harder for myself. I'm not really sure. I guess I just kind of feel like I'm... Maybe I'm. Maybe it's too self gratifying, or something to be sharing. Like, I I feel I really don't um, like the internet, but I feel very like I use it. I, I have it. You know, I have a computer, but I wish I didn't use it, and I wish I didn't have a website. You know, I feel very like idealistic about just wishing that the whole thing would just go away. But then, of course, I do use it to my advantage because most people do, and I don't have enough self control to actually stick by that and actually be totally analog. But I do wish that I was more like that. And I and yeah, I guess what I'm trying to say is, uh, I do like sharing my work on the internet because I do like getting. Um, those little boosts of people being like, this looks great, or I can't wait to see it, or when's it going to be done? That feels really good. And especially if you're feeling low or you're feeling unmotivated, that can really help you um, get that extra push to keep going. But at the same time, I think I'd rather um, rely a little bit more on myself to provide myself with like inspiration and motivation to make something. And like you said, I think it can be kind of um, difficult not to, if you get a ton of positive response on one thing and not so much on another, not to start maybe feeling like leaning towards the thing that people are liking more. And I would rather be making work that I feel like I'm, I'm progressing in the way I want to be progressing, not that I'm progressing in the way other people want me to be progressing. So maybe, maybe by sharing less, I would be less influenced by people's opinions because I wouldn't be getting them. But then again, um, yeah, it's it's really easy to um, be a little, maybe even a little reliant on um, positive feedback at times. Sometimes you need it, you know. So I don't know. I'm constantly at a conundrum with that. Sometimes I post a drawing on the internet and I immediately delete it because I'm like, why did I even post that? I'm like, I just let me. I'll just keep working. I don't need people to tell me what they think of it yet or even any time. I don't know. So that's the struggle I think for me, but. It's funny to talk about um, likability and appeal in the context of making work that's um, kind of vulgar or gross or um, scary or confrontational or what have you, where like, uh, part of the point is for it to be nasty. Um, but, you know, look, we're, there's an exhibit of Zap Comics, which were meant to be, you know, ugly and gross and nasty. And they're in a gallery, and the point of a gallery is to, you know, curate and um, present beauty, typically. So I guess that makes some sense. Do you find that, do any of you find that you, you revel in the, in the um, criticism or respond to it in a way? I mean, so I think that can be, <laughs> be such a trap, but sometimes it works for people where they actually are happy the post office won't deliver your mail. Uh, but beyond that, maybe it's the internet commenters or other 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 feedback you get from people. Is is there do any of you have a, a circumstance where you where you lean into that? I mean, I I love any response, pro or con, because it means people are paying attention and that if somebody is um, provoked either for happiness or anger or whatever, then the cartoon is effective. But it's really different depending on the audience. And like when I do the stuff about being Arab American and queer, I'm coming from a very Americanized vision of that context. And my friends in the Middle East are going to take these comics and they're like, I can't show these to my mom because she's going to think all dykes are sex crazed maniacs, you know? Mm -hmm. So I understand how the work we do has very different meanings in different contexts and different cultures. And, and I struggle with that in some ways because I, I want to speak to my own 
experience, but then I know that there's a lot of other experiences out there. So, and then over time things change, you know, what was shocking, you know, this stuff that was shocking in the sixties and seventies or seventies and eighties, then over time it takes on different things. Yeah. Just looks sexist, maybe. Right. <laughs> Racist. Yeah. It gets reduced to one thing, maybe. Um, I'd like to open it up for questions. Um, does anyone have any questions? I've got a microphone. Uh, you either speak up or I can hand this to you. Actually, uh, your last comment made me think of something about um, I'd like your opinions on how far to push the boundaries uh, and what the repercussions could be, especially about that uh, that cartoon of Mohammed. I'd, I'd like to hear your comments on that. Well, <laughs> actually, we were just talking about that. And, and the example I brought up was, I don't know if you have all saw that cartoon about the Obamas that the New Yorker printed on the cover where they depicted the Obamas as terrorists, as Muslim, and I don't know. Burning the flag and, and they were doing a fist bump, but, yeah. but dressed as, as radicals. And, and I thought that was kind of interesting because um, later I read a piece that had Michelle Obama talking about her reaction to that and how at first she was really horrified by that cartoon. And, and she understood the context, but she still was really horrified. And that so many of us saw that cartoon as, oh, this is the New Yorker making fun of the Republicans' view of the Obamas. Um, and that's sort of what the Charlie Hebdo thing is, is you know, or the idea that, oh, I can do these outrageous comics, uh, you know, even though I'm trampling on somebody else's beliefs. Um, and I guess my, my picture is that it's very complicated. Depending on who you are and what context you see that in, that, con that piece of art has very different meanings. If you saw that, that New Yorker co cover and you didn't know what the New Yorker stood for or even, you know, you would have a very different view of that comic. So as artists, what is our responsibility? And, and I think like that cover, would it have been different if it had been a picture of a, you know, old white male Republican with that as a bubble above their head? And I guess you said originally there were going to be Republicans looking in on that. Yeah, my understanding was the original cover kind of gave it that context. And they, for whatever, I don't want to speak for them, <laughs> but they decided that that actually limited it in a way. And they, I think they felt that they were trying to say that this is something that a lot of Americans fear, and rather to put it in the head of one person, they kind of wanted to sort of put it out there as something that is like in the back of the minds of lots of people. Mm -hmm. um, Francoise Mouly, is, who's the art director of the New Yorker, is very articulate about this stuff, and I'm not translating it as well, but, um, but they certainly as far as American publications of wide reach, they certainly push things pretty far. Yeah, so I think as artists, we have to think about how people are going to, see, what context people are going to see our work in. But then there's a point where you don't even know what context people are going to see their work, your work in. So, I, you know, me personally, I stand by everything I do, and I have a reason why, and I feel like I could defend it. Um, my, my general rule is don't shoot cartoonists. That's, that's kind of, that's my rule. Um, I guess this is a little, this isn't really a direct answer to the question you had posed, but just something I'm thinking about as a result of your answer to it, which is talking about what kind of context people see your work in and having to really pay attention to that. Uh, this is clearly a much, much less extreme example than the Charlie Hebdo situation. I'm not trying to compare it at all, but just as far as um, the first time I really like learned about uh, what it might be like to actually, like ever since this happened, I've thought a, a lot more about uh, the context surrounding my work is that there was an, there was an instance where my work was reproduced in an anthology and uh, my name wasn't immediately visible next to it. And a lot of people had assumed that I was a male artist. And because of that, a lot of people were really, really offended by my drawings because they depicted women, uh, like nude women in, in states of um, being 
you know, being very vulnerable, I suppose, and like various acts of what was being construed as like violence and non-consensual sexual acts and all of those all of those ideas and all of those those thoughts were coming up in people's minds because they assumed I was male. And as soon as people found out I was female, th the response was, oh, that's totally different. It's okay. Um, <laughs> which I... I, that is such a gray area. I don't. I don't dis. I don't agree or disagree with that. Really, it's so confusing and hard to approach. But it just what you were saying about having to think about context as a cartoonist really reminded me of that. Because ever since then, I've been hyper aware of my of my my status as like a as like a white female American artist who's making work about the the experience of being female and the fact that that's a, a privileged place to be coming from and a privileged, I'm privileged to be able to make work about that freely and express myself and post it on the internet and not receive any kind of threats. I mean, or, or any, any real, um, intent, like the most intense criticism or negativity that I usually get is like an, ooh, that's gross or like WTF type reaction, <laughs> unless people think I'm male and then it becomes a real, like, then people were really um, pulling out the big guns. But as soon as that was taken off the table, that it was a non-issue. So I don't know. I just, yeah, I don't, I still haven't totally formulated my thoughts on that situation, but it did sort of raise my awareness to the question of context. Um, which is something that I agree that's like a, that's huge. I didn't know about that New Yorker cover and now I'm really interested in seeing it. But um, that was something that I had thought about with the Charlie Hebdo situation. I mean, it's really interesting to think about how people coming from different vantage points um, might view something one way and people coming from a different one are thinking about it completely differently. It's so hard and intense to try to like reconcile how many different points of view there could be about one image. Um, yeah, I guess that's really all I have to say about that. Yeah, I think in like lots of other media, um, people will give uh, the creators kind of like the benefit of the doubt that the things that they're expressing don't come from them necessarily. Like in so many TV shows, there's like so many TV shows about horrible people and people don't assume that the creators are horrible people. And I think, I don't know, there's something about comics and cartoons where when people see um, the depiction of uh, something nasty happening or violent stuff or language, et cetera, they, it's, it's so um, you know personal putting uh, words and pictures the way you do it to that people, I think it's easy to judge that uh, especially people who aren't as familiar with like or don't read as many comics they will see a comics page of something violent happening and think you're kind of like creating like you're putting out something negative in the world and, and I kind of struggle with that like when by presenting it by presenting such a thing you're um, advocating for yeah, it yeah and like I don't know, yeah, I definitely struggle with that and like um, what I want to put my characters through and like do I, I don't know, yeah, because I, I want to make work about, you know, the, my own issues and the issues of the world, but um, I, like, I don't know, when I'm, when I'm writing like a, a villain, it still feels, I feel bad like putting like nasty stuff on the page and then sometimes it's the violence and Long question. I don't know what the point of it. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> no, it's fine. I think I know what you're getting at. And I mean, Kate, it's interesting. You were sort of suggesting that you sometimes draw things that make you uncomfortable. And I don't know if that's exactly what you're relating to, but if anyone has any comments about that general concept. Um, yeah. Um... So it sounds like your question was like, um, why in comics is uh, like negative and uh, transgressive content like really closely related to the creator and they're seen as being more responsible for it than if it was like in a TV show or a movie? Um, was that kind of the gist of it? Um, yeah, I guess, or, or just like, uh when when you're 
um, sh uh, show, like, I don't know, uh, when you're showing some kind of evil or, or, or bad, bad thing that humans do, you're not um, yeah. contributing to it or like, I, I don't know, like the, um, just I thinking about how people are going to view it and uh, yeah, I'm not trying to, tr you know, people are so triggered by all kinds of um, things now and um, just like I try to be as sensitive as possible but um, mm -hmm. when you're making, you know, work that's scary or that scares you, uh, how, do you how do you think about how it will be perceived? Yeah, so um you know, comics has a big autobio tradition and a lot of some of the most like um, nasty stuff, um, starting with Crumb, like there was plenty of, um, you know, dirty content in Zap, but it really quickly turned to like, here's my personal, you know, kink and here's, you know, a whole bunch of comics just about that. And a lot of stuff that's um, been most edgy in comics, like, uh, Diary of a Teenage Girl that just came out and stuff like that's so very, very um, pretty straight from, you know, the author's uh, personal background. So it's pretty easy, not just because um, the person who makes a comic is, you know, it's not like the um, superhero comics tradition where different people are involved. Usually in indie comics, it's just you. And it's just from you, um, unlike a regular comic or a TV show or something. And because people, um, there's such a history in comics of telling your own story through that, I think they probably do tend to be like pretty as closely associated with the person who did that. And it's really hard to distance it from it and be like, well, this is actually kind of a the general political statement or something like that, it's definitely seen as really closely reflecting your views. And that's something you have to be prepared to uh, either embrace or have some sort of, you know, response for, but, you know, to anticipate that people are going to think of it that way for sure. I have a couple thoughts on that. One is that in this country, we used to think of comics as something for children. And I think there's still a little bit of that left in people's mind that comics are for kids and they're funny and they're light and easy and fluffy. And so I think people go to comics with their defenses down a little bit. And so when they get really serious, heavy stuff, even today people can get like a little surprised by that, by discovering that in a comic. I mean, that's changing over time, but I think that's kind of an American thing, this idea that comics are for kids. And then the other thing is the, the comics, the reader has to do work to read a comic. Um, with, when you're watching a TV or film, you're kind of passive. And I mean, a book, you have to do a lot of work to create the image. But with, with comics, there's that unique thing of putting the words and pictures together by yourself, not in usually a crowd of other people. So it's a very alone thing, and you're putting it all together in your head. And, and so the reader is kind of actively involved in a unique way with comics. And I wonder if that's why people get like kind of freaked out when these heavy issues come up, because they're more involved. Whereas with a film or TV, you're a little more separate. I don't know. I mean, that's just an idea. I, I think there's something to that. I think there's something to the way that uh, especially like an independently made comic can have someone's worldview expressed in the drawing. It's unlike watching a big uh, feature film where there's a million people there and they're making sure everything looks perfect and it's the set dressing is perfect and all the actors are lit properly. Instead, you've got this very, this very handmade feeling object that you still deal with one-on-one. -on -one. So you sort of are sort of feeling like you're kind of looking into someone's brain. So it does get, it does have, uh, it has more impact, I think, that way. You've been holding the mic. Did you have anything else to say? <laughs> oh, so many things. <laughs> well, I disagree with the premise that comics are unique in that way. I feel like you'll find that in every art form. I think that the difference might be that people talk about comics less than they talk about other art forms. So when you watch TV, like... Everybody knows Breaking Bad. There's every bit as much of um, 
criticism. Not as many people go at the author by name, but they definitely say those people. And, you know, they talk about like how those people endorse this and this and this and all that other stuff. And the thing is that there's just more people talking and therefore there's more discussion and more people are just like, this is fiction. This is not real. This is about a, and, um, and I find that when you have less uh, discussion about an art form, you have the, the standout pieces, which are the ones where people are not invested in the art form and, or even not the art form, but not invested in the thing that they're talking about. They are dismissing it. They don't like it. They are the ones who are going to talk. Whereas the people who are invested are, less likely to talk because there's just less communication in general. So you have uh, comics with very low amounts of uh, discussion about comics of any kind. And so the only thing you might hear is the person who just read the thing is like, ugh, please, gross, these people are sick. But um, when, you do, when you deal with like movies, there's plenty of people talking about them. And, um, and another thing I find interesting is that um, – I see the same thing with uh, attributing the product with the author in uh, hip hop, rap, and a lot of that is because people don't talk about rap really because, um, well, there's many reasons, but they just don't. So the, the most you'll hear is just like, these people are insane, they're sick. And it's the same stuff you hear about um, about uh, these types of comics. And and it, and it goes back again to go over to the superhero side of comics. There's um, more discussion than they'll have in um, the small indie underground section of comics, and so they, so so I feel like it's just the quantity of discussion that gets you that because those voices get more diffused and more drowned out by other opinions where there are just a general a larger body of people or a larger regular number and larger percentage of people sharing their opinions. Um, because you know negativity will pretty much um, come forth, but but and if somebody expresses a negative point of view, people are less le likely to come forth with a positive point of view because people don't like to be seen as bad. So if somebody says this is bad, there's somebody else might be like, oh maybe it is. I don't know. So um, you know, it, 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 I, I'm not entirely sure that, that is even a thing that is specific to comics or unique. I see it everywhere. I see it in prose. I see it in, like I said, music, TV, film. I think that that's just a condition of people. And, and there's many reasons why you shouldn't, why you can't separate the author from the product because in a lot of ways, the author is, is the thing that they make. Even if they are not saying, I agree with the things that are happening, there's still a, an aspect to which they are making this happen in your head. And sometimes... One thing that's also interesting is that in comics you are creating things from things that don't exist. You have uh, you have nothing, and then you have to create it all. Whereas in a television show or movie, you turn you take a camera, point it at stuff, and turn it on. Most of that stuff already exists. Um, in comics, you actually are intentionally making this happen, which is like really takes a lot more determination to do to say like I'm going to make this horrible thing happen from on a blank piece of paper you know so i, I so th even if there is a little bit more people taking it personally i think it kind of makes sense in that way even if it's subconscious because we know that like even though we know that films regular standard films are just make believe they're fiction too there's still that feeling of like you just invented that whole horrible scene on that paper just to mess with me like so you know um so i don't know I think we have time for one more question. The question was about getting over a uh, writer's block or artist block. I personally, if I'm if I'm feeling uninspired or sort of like I'm coming up dry with the concepts or that I'm trying to work through or even if I'm just like putting the pen to paper and it's like not working for me that day it's really looking at other people's artwork and trying to discover new artwork that I maybe haven't seen before that helps me start getting inspired not even necessarily comics like lately the things that have been inspiring me the most are like classical paintings which is something I never thought I would even be interested in but I just checked a bunch of books out of the library and started like just trying to understand like why are these 
paintings that I always found so boring so important? Like, why does everyone think they're so important? And just sort of, I mean, that's just an example, like, not that you should look at classical paintings necessarily, but, like, I mean that, like, I, by, like, forcing myself to, like, delve into, like, understanding a new art form and, like, really getting in there and trying to then finally coming out on the other side being like, wow, this is super inspiring and incredible in, like, ways that I had never really thought about and there's, like, aspects to this form of art that maybe I can incorporate into my own, or even if I don't, like just t you end up taking something away from it as somebody who draws or makes art in any way. I think there's a lot to be said for trying, trying your best to like understand and sort of excavate other, other modes of art, even music. I mean, just even, not even necessarily visual, but yeah, I think that when I, when I'm feeling really uninspired, it's just like trying to learn and absorb more, uh, more artwork by different people and expand my horizons kind of. And that is, I know I said I hate the internet before, but the internet is so good for that. So that is one thing I do love about the internet is that that makes it so accessible. You don't even have to go to the library. So that's what I would recommend personally. Yeah, I, I second that. I think looking at other art and other forms of art, non-comics forms of art is really good. I also think that, um, sometimes it's good to do a project that doesn't have a lot of meaning to it. Like I often will just make a birthday card for somebody, you know, and it takes the pressure off. It's just a fun little thing. And, and I'm still using those creative muscles, but it's, it's not so precious. And then the other thing is as artists, we have to forgive ourselves and allow ourselves time when we aren't doing our best. And I think that the longer I'm an artist, there are times when you just fuck up. There are times when life gets in the way. There are times when your health gets in the way. There are all kinds of things that happen that prevent you from being the perfect artist you think that you should be. And we all have to forgive ourselves and be patient. And sometimes it's just time. I absolutely agree with both of you. Um, and I picture the creative process like it's a bodily system. Um, and you have to be bringing in um, sort of a creative nourishment by, um, you know, uh, looking at and um, reading things that are, are interesting to you. And you have to be um, regularly moving it through you. Um, you have to be like eating and shitting. And um, even if that just means doing some figure drawings um, and copying things in a rote way or doing a birthday card or doing some drawings that are just like low stakes and bad and you don't need for them to be doing anything except like keeping the artistic bowel moving. Um, that's really important just to like keep the f the funnel greased, so to speak, because you're like, well, you're gonna be ready then to receive inspiration and have it come through you in a way that's fluid. If you've kept your drawing in shape and kept, you know, your mind happy and inspired by looking at good stuff, and you kind of have to care for your system that way, I think, by making time for those things. In my experience. Um Writer's block is usually a traffic jam, not an absence. Just like uh, it's a kind of anxiety of sort of a combination of a predetermined desired outcome. Like I want to make this thing a comic and, um, and a rush of too many ideas and also just other types of conflicts. Like, I don't know if I should do this. I don't know if I should do that. I don't know if I'm allowed to do this. And um, that's part of the reason I think that when we take breaks from the project we're trying to do, that everything loosens up. Because a lot of what seems to be holding people back, in my opinion, in my own experience, and when I listen to others, is like they're trying to force it out too much and they're trying to force it into a predetermined shape like I know what this needs to be on the other side I just need to make it happen and sometimes you can't just force that so sometimes like uh, switching to another project is a good idea for example or just uh, or giving well I don't know comics are kind of this weird thing where like a lot of it is commercial but like if it's possible if you could just say uh, instead of determining what the outcome should be just uh do whatever if you if you're in the position to be able to like do whatever then absolutely do whatever and 
you might feel weird about it. Like, I shouldn't have drawn that. What if my mother sees it and all that stuff? Everybody will love it. Trust me. It'll be your most popular thing all the time. Also, your mother will love it too. Everybody loves it, you know? <laughs> and, um, but yeah, like a lot of times it's just, it just seems to be just sort of like this anxiety of, 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 that belief in the structure of what things have to look like. What, and it's the same with novels, music, and all the other types of art forms. It's just like, you know what it has to be like, and you're so focused on that that you can't actually like let the, your ability just flow through. Well, that's a good place to, to get everyone uh, inspired. Thank you everyone for coming today. And thanks again to Daryl Ayo, Jennifer Camper, Heather Benjamin, and Kate LaCour. Thanks.